موظف مهندس العمارة الإسلامية التكنولوجيا الحديثة لبناء بيئات تلبي طموحات الأجيال القادمة هذا هو موضوع جلستنا الأخيرة لهذا اليوم ومن هذا الموقع رحبوا معي بالمتحدثين في هذه الجلسة حول العمارة الإسلامية وهم أحمد علي رئيس مجلس إدارة إكس أركيتكت من دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة إدريان لحود قيم ترينالي الشارقة للعمارة عميد كلية العمارة في الكلية الملكية للأداب والفنون من المملكة المتحدة ومارينا تبسم مديرة مارينا تبسم أركيتكتس وحائزة على جائزة الأغا خان للعمارة لعام 2016 من بنغلاديش أما مدير الجلسة فاروق درخشاني الأمين العام لجائزة الأغا خان للعمارة من سويسرا رحبوا بهم جميعا it's going to do it as fast as possible because I've been told that I have to make sure that once I get the three minutes, five minutes uh, signals, I have to stop. Um, it's just great to have uh, end up with architecture. The whole thing is today we've been, all, every single person has been talking about what means Islamic art and architecture. Actually, the only word which was not used is the, what is the, we're talking about the culture of the Muslim societies. Muslim societies versus architecture for Islamic world, or architecture for uh, Islamic architecture, etc. was just we've been discussing about. But what we're talking about, in fact, is the societies. And societies as where the people who are using the art and culture and architecture are, um, are those are the people who count. And that is where, when we talk about culture and we talk about art, we sometimes we're, it's for specific people, for specific uh, um, moments, but it's not for everyday life. Everyday life is that's what architecture uh, covers. It's what we we're in this space, we're breathing this space, we're walking around us, the whole environment, and that is what makes our society. What is important is to make sure that when we're walking around anywhere else in the world we are, the architecture. The, the way the cities are built, they're representatives of our societies, of that society. If there's a chaos in the architecture, it shows the chaotic um, um, uh, way that that society is uh, living. And when it's very orderly, that shows us also that society. It, I'm, I'm not saying that which one is better than the other ones, because sometimes when it's too orderly, it becomes too boring. So that is one area. One other thing which was very important that we were thinking, what is the locale? We are talking about where we are talking about. We are talking about which countries, which places, which places in this world. Are we actually talking about countries or regions? We are not talking about countries and regions because today, especially to, in the world today, uh, the whole world has been interconnected. We are not living in small pockets in different parts of the world. And also, there are certain things, which, especially when it comes to the faith and what is, called, what is we calling the Islamic the art and architecture of the Muslim societies, it expands not only from Indonesia into Nigeria, which uh, Venetia Porter was explaining a little bit earlier, but we're talking about the, all the Muslim diaspora today. We have got, I mean, the Muslim population of, of certain cities of uh, let's call, um, I mean, like Paris or France, etc. It's much bigger than the Muslim population of some other small countries, which we think that they're 100% Muslim. So that is a way, also a way to see that we are talking about people are living together. We are not living in some single uh, monolithic um, uh, uh, societies, but it's just uh, being together. At the same time, historically, we, we just forget certain things. It becomes sometimes of our ignorance that, you know, which part, what is, this, what is where is Muslim people are. I'm just coming back from Beijing, and there is, we, I was in a neighborhood which is just south of Tiananmen Square, and this is the Muslim neighborhood, one of the Muslim neighborhoods of Beijing, which is the mosque there, it goes to 1,200 years ago. It's not new. These are not the migrants. They're not the people who came back. They are the first Muslim of China. So that is just to uh, just show the, how it was talking. And also, we talk, earlier we talking, uh, heard Mona Khazinda was talking about France and how the diaspora is going there. Today, we are very lucky to have three people here, which each of them represent a different uh, aspect of the world of architecture. Um, I'm very proud to have Ahmed here because he represents the first generation of architects who have been trained in the UAE. He, is from the, um, he was trained at the American University of Sharjah, and that is very important because sometimes you have these trajectories. You have to think that every single person had to go to one of these 
uh, famous universities, Ivy Leagues in America come back, I mean, that's, that's the only way you can get a job. He showed that you don't need to go away to get a job. You can be trained here in this country, you're local, and you can do what you can do at the best, because he is connected to the world. He's not confined to this part of the world. I'm using him as a, a kind of a representative of a whole generation, which is very important. I have, this, I have this, the same thing I can say about Marina Tabassum. Marina Tabassum from Bangladesh, she studied in Bangladesh, she's worked most of her work in uh, Bangladesh. She teaches now in GSD in, at Harvard. So it means that you don't, know, you don't need to go through that very classical way of the, you know, these schools, etc., to be a part of the, an, uh, an active and, and a, uh, achieved person in the society. And lastly, with Adrian is with me here. I can't say the same things about Adrian. He's just, but what he's doing is very important. What he's doing is that he has come, he's bringing to today to, um, he's now teaching at London, as for those of you know, and he's responsible for education. We t Antonio was just talking about what is important is education, education, education. Education is a very important factor, and we have to be very careful. Well, who are we educating? Education is not, we're not only educating young people who are um, going to school, or I mean, this is the new generation. What is very important, especially in the world of architecture, how you educate your client. If you don't educate your client, you will not be able to get a good project. And that is one of the key issues in architecture. The big difference between architecture and other forms of art is that the other forms of art, is the art pieces, they can be there, they can be created, can be appreciated, they can vanish. Nothing, I mean, that, that's what it is. It's been very bad for the heritage, but that's it. But when we do architecture, we built these horrible buildings, and it's gonna be staying there forever. And that is where they have to have, so if you have a bad client for a bad project, you're gonna get that forever. Now, I would think that I will ask Adrian to start to, to, to talk because he's got a presentation. Um, how do we talk about different cultures? How do we talk about Islamic culture in the context of the dominance of a single way of living together? Okay, so let's go through this. I'm going to start with an exam because it's the end of the day. I want to ask um, the people in the audience whether anyone knows what these cities have in common. Does anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, sorry? Close, actually. They're, they're the cities that are going to have the highest population in the world by 2100. So what's really interesting is where, the, where they are, and to notice that only five from the existing um, top 20 are in that list. So in the next 33 years, we'll have to build cities for an additional 2.5 billion people. That's equal to a new United Kingdom and Ireland every year. It's equal to a new Barcelona every week, obviously with a very different quality of life. Every week, that's 280,000 houses, 24,000 six-story buildings, 2,000 60-story towers. So, what will it look like, who will design it, and who will build it? And more importantly, what quality of life will be possible? And I think this is a profound architectural challenge. So the value of the global construction ind industry at the moment is eight trillion. In 2020, it'll be 13 trillion. And two out of every three dollars will be spent in this part of the world. Now what's interesting is that we've seen a huge economy being um, emerging around the mapping of all of the external spaces of cities. So on the back of Google Street View and Google Maps, you're seeing all of these various platforms and new economies developing. Um, and you know about all of these new um, remote sensing technologies, satellite imagery, these things are now very, very familiar. Um, this is a really interesting example of a recent project that I saw, um, which was using com combining machine learning um, and remote sensing to understand the material type of roofs in a small village in Sri Lanka. They were then combining that to try to get more accurate socioeconomic data because they don't have very um, <coughs> censuses very often. And this is a really old history. We know that science and technology have been transforming the way we, city, we think about cities at least since the early 1800s. One question, which is a kind of mystery, is that we know almost nothing about interior spaces. We spend about 89 to 92% of our lives indoors. Those spaces exist in an informational blind spot. There are various kinds of attempts at the moment to try to understand what our interior spaces look like. They don't really scale up, as you can see here. Um, this is a fantastic one. Does anybody have a Roomba robot at home? I don't know if you know this, but the Roomba robot's business model is based on scanning your floor plans and sending them back and on-selling them. 
So it's actually a data harvesting strategy as much as it is meant to clean your floors effectively while you're not home. <laughs> of course, this raises all kinds of interesting privacy issues. So a project, and just to kind of recap, so here we are. These are the most populated cities. What is our position as architects thinking about the next generation of architectural education? These are the challenges that we're facing. Now, what I want to talk about very briefly to conclude is a, is a project that we're working on at the Royal College of Art, which is to combine, um, is to basically develop a form of machine learning that allows machines to read architectural floor plans. And what we're trying to do is, for the first time, understand cities, not just in terms of their external spaces, but in terms of their interior spaces. That is to create a complete understanding of what a typical apartment layout is like. You know, there are housing crises all over the world. We don't know what an average apartment looks like in most cities. What we want to do is cross-reference that to demographic data and ask the question, actually, does the repetition of a single building type, a single apartment type, a single apartment layout, the nuclear family layout, in all of those cities in the world, because that's what's going to get rolled out, the only way that we can imagine living together? And I think this is an important question, not just in the context of Islamic societies, because we know those apartments tend to isolate people, they disconnect social connections, they disconnect intergenerational relationships, they make it difficult for extended families to live together, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I just want to leave it on that question, actually, um, and to try to connect this issue of um, how we scale up architectural knowledge, you know, how we start thinking about the scale of these challenges, how we start thinking about architecture in urban terms, but always by reconnecting it to the kinds of lives that we want to lead. And I think ultimately that's far more important a question for Islamic societies and for other societies. Um, in fact, and, and a more important question ultimately than, than the aesthetics of those buildings or questions of motifs, et cetera. Anyway, I'll, I'll finish it there. What do you define as Islamic architecture in our time, in a time like this? Um, where um, you know art can be done from any different location. Perhaps it's much more of a mental uh, space that requires uh, for an art artist to be with. But for architecture, you really require to be in a certain geographical location. And the geographical location actually makes a lot of um, design decisions or architectural decisions that um, manifests into architecture. So. Um, I think it's important to redefine this whole idea of architecture in the Islamic world because the world is expanding. Muslims are in many different places. The requirement of uh, different kind of architectural uh, spaces are growing and, and it's not being defined within a certain geographical location anymore. It's everywhere. So that's why I think that's important to kind of define this whole uh, boundary of uh, what our discussion is today about Islamic architecture. So that was one thing I thought of um, talking about. And then the other thing is um, quite often we, when we talk about, let's say, architecture in this Islamic sense, we tend to um, focus more on the visual aspect uh, rather than the values that Islam has preached and taught. Um, so that's something I think it's very important to also address uh, because um, you know, there are certain values which are, I mean, very human values, which are very in, you know, important to address, I think. Uh, modesty, humbleness. I, I actually worked on the uh, Abu Dhabi Mosque Development Regulation Guideline uh, in 2011 when I came here and actually I, um, I had an extensive study of the vernacular architecture that used to be of this region of UAE. And I think those uh, structures very um, uniquely talks about these very essential idea of what Islam has preached uh, throughout. So that's about modesty, about sustainability, about social communal connectivity. Uh, which was also seen into the c cities. Uh, and as Adrian was just mentioning about these cities, we have never really looked deeply into the cities that were there in, the, in, in let's say, the Middle Eastern region, especially um, in this Islamic, uh, uh, you know, the way it has been built. So those cities really had that connectivity. Even now, uh, if you go to villages, like I come from Bangladesh, and when I go to the villages, 
the kind of communal atmosphere that you see, the way people live their lives, is uh, still something that uh, has a lot of value. So those values are very important, I think. So rather than going towards something very visual, um, visual can always at times turn into pastiche, uh, it's always better to follow the values, I would suggest. And I think that's what I would like to talk about. Um, so that's the other thing. And uh, well, I think I could probably conclude here. And uh, definitely, it's interesting uh, when you become, uh, especially in the UAE and, and, and Dubai in particular, when you are, um, uh, the, the, the term society is really something interesting because you are not talking about uh, a specific uh, uh, nationality. You are not talking about a specific uh, even religion. Uh, or race or color. Uh, we've been really uh, grown with such a beautiful diversity uh, 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 around the world. And, um, and uh, at the same time, we are rooted and grown, uh, uh, born in, in Dubai, in, in UAE. <coughs> so we have very strong fundamentals and values uh, of the society and also um, uh, clear, uh, let's say, um, uh, value sets. Uh, having said that, uh, born in such a beautiful, diverse uh, community, uh, give you the flexibility, let's say, uh, to, to question uh, um, what is the future? Um, what is, uh, uh, how we could really push forward? Um, uh, it's, it's not a way that is uh, a theoretical, but uh, a really uh, a way to, to uh, it's not a theoretical proposition. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's the people who you deal with, uh, you work with, you get inspired by, uh, as you say, in, uh, in architecture, you are not alone. You have to interact with uh, the society. You have to interact with the uh, authorities, with the clients, with the community. And in that case, this amazing different point of view that comes from and the inputs, different inputs, uh, gives you, let's say, uh, uh, a release from uh, being nostalgic, and especially being nostalgic about uh, uh, architecture and being about specific forms or the specific uh, shape that your design has to uh, take. So you focus actually on values rather than you focus on, uh, on, on, uh, on shape or form or a specific kind of uh, 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 parameters and um, being specifically in Dubai where everything is really pushing so fast and so in a, in a much larger scale uh, um, um, also questions what is really important for us uh, what can be important as an architect to carry is it really the uh, the architectural language or the specific way of designing is it um, uh, no, it's big, bigger than that. Uh, uh, how you could capture the spirit uh, of, of a time and people and actually um, find a common ground uh, uh, um, connecting all these different mosaics, let's say, of, uh, of point of view. Um, I think this is very rewarding being in, in, this, in, 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 in this part of the world. Um, uh, I feel really sad that that um, you don't, uh, with all this architecture happening in, in Dubai and, 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 and UAE in general and in the Middle East, um, we, there are things, of course, to learn from that kind of uh, amazing city that is working as a kind of an economical machine and working in a beautiful way to connect all of us together. But also very sad how architecture and architectural thinking about space and about integrating values and integrating what really matters has been put aside for uh, a pure kind of uh, capitalist uh, way of moving forward. So uh, how you really, what does matter <coughs> for us in the future as an architects? Uh, it's really a problematic uh, because it's a new question and nobody knows how to answer it. Uh, so I come to that. It is very important 
each one of us here from different backgrounds, different point of view, to really try uh, our best to say it, might, it could be like that. And this, is, this could be the, the, the answer. You who have been grown up here, etc., uh, to university, and someone has been living in Rome, or I live in Geneva, nothing changes. Every, it says looks, every, everything looks like what it looks, used to look like. In your time, your li uh, lifetime, you will not see those changes. And here, every day you see the changes and how that can have an yeah. impact on the way you think. Because one of the most important things which has become the responsibility of architecture is architects are doing what they, between the time that they have got a, an idea and the time that that project is completed, usually it takes a long time. Not here, in the rest of the world. I'm not talking about here. It's always done yesterday. But this is, it, this is very important. It takes time. And now you have to have, how can you think about what will be the aspirations of the younger generation, those people who will be the users of these same build that what you have created for so many years ahead? Because that, the, the buildings don't change as fast as the society changes and how we can have this adaptability. And that's a very interesting observation. I was just thinking what you think. But how, but there's one thing which is very important is that your generation, you and your other, you don't feel that you're different to those people who are working outside. No, no because you're part of this whole thing. So you are making our history today. You are very, because what is, I mean, um, I, I can see it in different parts of the world. There was a period that everybody was looking at the other as a model and not just being because somehow there was this sense that we are behind and looking at the others as models was becoming, and this has changed everywhere. I, can, I mean, this is something I've noticed, that you go to different parts of the world, and the younger generations have got this way of looking at things which is very different to the generation of the, after World War II, let's say, which that was where the biggest expansion started. I mean, Adrian, you, you have been, you're also coming from, from Australia, that's where you are. I mean, that's a, the other part of the world, somewhere that people don't know. And that whole thing of the making a, a, a society, making cities, etc., has been a very important way, at least because there was not, it was not the same thing as London. It was not a continuation. It was the rebuilding and today reinterpreting what it, uh, architecture is. And, and I think you're right. I think there is definitely a sense of a renewed belief in the value of what's here. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean that throughout the region. And that's really exciting, that sense of autonomy um, and a recognition of the, of the richness of the histories that are already here. Um, but I think there are some challenges as well. And I, I think some of the challenges for an emerging generation of architects, especially in the UAE, um, is that the, the kind of the economy of architecture doesn't make it so easy to get out into practice after graduation, you know? So, so actually, I think one of the things that I'm always thinking about, especially with the Sharjah Architecture Triennial coming up, is like, what are those bridges that you can start to build between graduating as an architect? Um, where, you know, who's providing those small opportunities that you can use to establish a, to establish a studio, to experiment, to try out some of your ideas, and then gradually um, um, build a bigger and bigger practice? There are exceptions, but I think there's still important work to be done. Right. How you, you felt that, I mean, your project, as an example, has become, um, I mean, successful in a, in a way. What was that process? Because that process is very important to explain to others that how can the mindset, not good, I'm not saying that what you're saying, everybody should do the same, no, but just as an experience, yeah. I mean, how you've... Yeah, well, um, I think um, one thing that I would really like to mention here is that, you know, where I come from, obviously, uh, we have a large amount of population who are living below the uh, a certain line. income group, let's say. It's a much more lower income family. So, and that's why um, it's important, and especially in terms of architecture, since we're talking about the future of architecture, um, what, ha what we haven't done, I think, um, in our profession is address this this 99 or let's say 90 percent of the people who are not within our radar yep. um, of profession. Uh, 90 percent of the population in the world are unable to afford an architect or an architect's uh, service because we are 
uh, we do not cater that way. So that's why I think it's important for us to make our profession very relevant. And the mosque, in a way, was that kind of an idea that where you also engage people, uh, you become uh, a part of them in a way to, to be with the community, to understand their aspirations. Uh, and it's a place where in a very dense neighborhood, Dhaka, as Adrian was showing, was the first name, um, is a city of 20 million people. So this is a very dense and a fast growing city. And so the challenges are quite different. It's a city in constant transition. And as you were mentioning that Dubai and Abu Dhabi has grown really fast in a, in a very short time. Similar to Dhaka has also um, grown within the last 20 years, actually. It's all about development, capitalism, real estate development. And, and, but this large section of people have always been completely ignored their interests have always been ignored. So that's why that was one major agenda for me. And if you ask about the question of architecture, the language of architecture, let's say in my case, the mosque, um, it was sort of a process where I went back completely to the very beginning of uh, the question of you know, the inception of mosque, how mosque came into being, uh, going absolutely to the very start, uh, let's say, uh, when the Prophet's mosque was built. So how and where and from what context it came about? And was it about symbols? Was it about identity? Or was it about a space where people can congregate? You know, the, the whole sense of uh, act of prayer and the act of being together and in a congregation. So though I, as I was mentioning, that the values are important to me rather than the symbols. Because symbols are what is wrong. Uh, in, mm. let's say, in architecture. Um, we have got uh, some time for questions and answers and comments. If you want to add anything from this, uh, the, the, there is any questions, brave questions. Uh, no, it's more question in general, you know, how, what kind of role, you know, the government um, has in terms of like consulting architects, you know, for the future, like in terms of when we see those cities and obviously we know what's going to happen. It's like, what is discussed in those plans with like, you know, is there committees of architect meeting and discussing, you know, the future or building, you know, future cities that make sense, you know, for the population that they are expecting or not? Well, uh, maybe if yeah, you can... Maybe. You? Yeah, I, I think the problem, governments are not really consulting architects, they are consulting engineers, you know. And I, I think it's a big problem, uh, to be honest. I think engineers are coming in, uh, as a kind of uh, savior for the 21st century, representing themselves as, uh, as uh, they can do it on time, on budget, they can make it really work, and uh, putting themselves that they're saying, okay, the challenge is big, bigger than an architectural discourse and an architect's, so we have to really uh, shall we say, uh, and client, uh, unfortunately, bought to. Uh, if you look at Dubai, Abu Dhabi, most of the people or most of the companies that are practicing in Dubai are engineering companies that they say they add architecture to their, uh, to their uh, components, but mainly they are engineering companies. And, and, uh, and, and they did such a ter terrible uh, job, to be honest, yani. that's why we are we are seeing cities like uh, D Dubai, like uh, Abu Dhabi, is working as a city, beautiful, is attracting people and all of that, but it's not an inspiring at all. And, 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 and this is the difference between an architect and an engineer. And architects have a broader and much larger understanding of humanities, of feelings, of society needs, of yeah. spirit of the time, and also has the technical capabilities to put complex things together, traffic, uh, population, whatever, uh, a, a, a huge complex uh, problems. And marry these two in a beautiful way. And unfortunately, this is not happening now. Adrian? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, and my response would be slightly different, although I agree that the dominance of like, engineering is, is, is an issue. It's, it's, it's that we only can imagine our cities in terms of real estate speculation, right? Um, and so the question about like what, what is the responsibility of government, first you would need to be able to distinguish between governments and real estate speculation. And actually in this part of the world, that's also really hard to do. Yeah. 
And in many parts of the world, it's very hard to do, it's fair to say. Um, so what other, what other economic models are there? Um, and I think that's, that's the core of it. Yeah, we need, to, we need to fight for other ways of imagining what those cities can be. Because you're right, they will just be rolled out as either high-end luxury developments for the 1% and leave 90% of people out. Um, or they'll be designed by engineers and subdivided and sold off at the cheapest price for a profit. How to change the people's way of thinking? Because to be just be some people sometimes the societies are not aware of what they wa should want. Because I'm sure if the I mean the whole thing is that the, a developer doesn't want to do bad, but he doesn't have good uh, ways of uh, I mean doesn't have good examples. Doesn't know what is better. Because if he does a good project, he will sell better. He'll make more money. Yeah. So communication has got a very important role and Absolutely. discussions. I mean the events like the Triennale, Architect Triennale, can have an impact as such. Do it just it cre creates an. Uh, a, a, a moment for the certain clients to look back and also for the people who are the final clients, the users, end users, to ask for better. Yeah. If you know what is good, then you will ask better. And this comes not only for the developers, but also for the, uh, for the uh, governments. Because you have to have this kind of a dialogue, which that's the most important thing. And that's a role of yeah. events like today, or events like uh, Arctic Char Charger, will have an important impact. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, I see the Charger event as much as for the general public, as for you know, working with the municipality, working with developers. And, and, and shifting culture. And I think maybe one word that's really important when we think about city making is patience. And actually what's been really beautiful about Sharjah is its patience. Um, and, and, and I think that that's, that maybe when we talk about values and, and, and the way cities grow, maybe patience is a really important value to like, let things grow in their own so way right. and to give them space to breathe and the freedom to develop is, is important. We can take one more question because we, uh, before we, yes please. Um, what I find interesting here, or maybe a question for you, is all the buildings that are destroyed to make room for other buildings. It's one thing to build on nothing, but destroying heritage, and well, who decides what's heritage? And is there a way to use these old buildings and kind of re-bring, you know, I don't know, enhance them so they can become part of the future? I can imagine that the function can change. So there are other ways of doing it, repurposing it, giving it new life. Um, changing the entire uh, usage and making it something else. There's always scope to enhance and, and make better use. It's not always necessary to, to tear things down and rebuild it. And more importantly, uh, especially heritage, uh, and there has been a lot of damage already done in many places where um, you know, history has been erased. So I think that's also very important to remember that history is where we hold our ground uh, before we fly up. So, so it's important to remember that and recognize that. So I completely agree. What we're talking about, the heritage, what you're saying that's been demolished, is what has been built f during a very long period of time, which it, it has a lot of memories of that s society, of that nation. And that is, has been there. That's why we're giving additional value to that. But I think on the other one, we cannot say that you cannot, don't want to, everything to be demolished, because a lot of buildings around us, we wouldn't mind that if they were demolished. <laughs> <laughs> you can change the facades. Like all the glass buildings I see here, I would really love to. <laughs> change the facade. <laughs> thank you very much for your time and again thanks for the uh, Ministry of uh, Culture that have organized this event. It was a wonderful event and f congratulations. Thank you very much.